Well, we have been busy learning from God's Word through His servant James. And the chapter of the letter he wrote to people in his day um, is the letter that we have as James in our Bibles. We are busy with chapter 2 and the passage specifically that we are looking at at the moment is chapter 2 verses 14 to 26. So please turn there with me as we read God's word together. <clears throat> the heading in the NIV is faith and deeds. James writes, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? Save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that, that there's one God? Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So far the reading of God's word. It is always important to mean what we say and say what we mean, isn't it? We are dealing with a passage in James's letter that is maybe the most understood and misapplied passage, or at least one of them, in the New Testament. Just listen, he says a provocative thing there in verse 24. A thing like, a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. By now that must kind of kick against what we've heard over and over and over in our sermons, that we are saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. So what is James saying here? Did, did we hear him correctly? Aren't we all about faith alone and Christ alone and grace alone? Just, just, does James then mean that we, we need to add works and deeds to our faith to be saved? As if Christ did 50% and the other 50% is up to me that I have to add to that? Well, some people take this passage and say, well, that is that. And, and the, Believe that. Some would say, go so far as to say, no, we only need then good works. Look what James is saying. We are declared or considered righteous by what we do. What, what shall we do with Paul then? <laughs> Who says in Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9, I mean, there are many examples. But just, just looking at those two verses in, verses in Ephesians 2, what shall we do with Paul then when he says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Isn't that what we believe? And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one may boast. Did James have a different picture of salvation than, than Paul? You see, we need to know what James means when he says a thing like a person is considered righteous by what they do. We need to know what he means when he uses words like righteous and works or deeds or to do and faith. Now, Pastor Kali mentioned it this morning and it's in my sermon as well. The context we find these 
words in are very important. The historical background of the writer and the people he wrote to and what was going on at that time in history is important. The language in which it was written, the grammar that is used to, to write those languages in are all things that we need to consider to get an understanding of what the Bible writers are telling us. To understand what James means when he uses words like righteous and to do or works and faith. Let me give you an example. And I've done this before, so please forgive me. But I think it, it carries the idea that I want to convey to you. What, what do you understand when I say the following? I found a mouse on the desk in my study. Now a certain generation will hear me and immediately think of a rodent with long teeth, long tail, that might have been lying there for some time and stinks. Another generation will hear me and, and think of an egg-shaped device next to my computer, which I use to control my computer. You see, only the context, the historical background, the language I use, will tell you what I mean. And it's the same here with James. It's the same in the Bible throughout. So with all this in mind, what did James mean when he used words that, like we find there in verse 24 of righteous and to do and faith? Well, let's start with the last one, faith. What did he mean by that? Now the context for this word is the kind of faith that he gave an example of in verse 16. Look there. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical need, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. He's talking about a man who goes to church and see another one who is struggling, poor, but does not help him. His faith does not go over into, into wo his words does not go over into action. A faith that has a, a verbal creed that he might have, but that is as far as it went for that man. If he had a faith that only acknowledged God and who he is, but that was as far as his faith went. He had a faith that was an intellectual acknowledgement of who God is, but there were no deeds flowing from his faith. And that's why James, James concludes, it's a dead faith. It's a useless faith to save. It's, you know what? It's the kind of faith the demons have. He says there in verse 19. Is it saving faith? No, absolutely not. It is just an acknowledgement and understanding and knowing of who God is. This, in, this includes the person who thinks he is a, Christ, a Christian because his parents are, that his faith is somehow hereditary. It includes the person who thinks he is a Christian because of his culture. If his culture is somehow rooted in Christian principles, that would make him fine with God. Or the person who thinks he's a Christ, Christian because he has been baptized or because he con confessed Christ verbally in front of many people or repeated a Christian creed somehow and that were, those were the magic words that made him a Christian. No, this is the kind of faith James is addressing here who only explains itself in words. But it doesn't go over into deeds. It's a very different... It is very different from the, the word Paul uses for faith as we've just read in Ephesians 2 verse 9, which referred to it as a gift from God, a total trust in Christ for a righteousness we do not have. The kind of faith that James has in mind here is that kind of intellectual acknowledgement maybe, a certain body of knowledge that we have, and we think that is enough for salvation. He calls it a dead faith. Let's look at the second word we need to clarify. The word to do there in verse 24. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do or by their works or by their deeds. Well, the works of mercy James had mentioned so far gives us 
a good idea what he means when he speaks of works. He, he refers to those actions in the lives of true believers in Christ that flows from a new life in Christ. Like the ones that we've seen so far, keeping a tight rein on your tongue, being slow to become angry, looking after orphans and widows, not showing favoritism, showing mercy, helping those who are poor. What he's not doing is he's not referring to the reliance on the Jewish law to get right with God here. That is what Paul does many times when he says a thing like we read in Romans 3 verse 20. By the works of the law, no flesh, no flesh will be justified. James is not saying the same thing when he speaks of works or to do in this, in this case and in this letter. Specifically this passage that we are busy with now. But James is also not saying that we can be saved by our works as a means to get right with God. He's also not saying that we must add works to faith, like we've seen a minute or so ago. What he has in mind is summed up by a pastor by the name of Jeff Thomas, and he does it so well, puts it in a nutshell. James's doctrine on faith and works in one sentence. I'm quoting him. We are saved through faith alone. But the faith that saves is never alone. It is always zealous to do good works. Let me repeat that. We are saved through faith alone. But the faith that saves is never alone. It is always zealous to do good works. The third word that, that we need to dig into and get right is the word righteous or justify in some transla translations. When, when James then, verse 24, uses the, word, the words considered righteous by, what does he mean? What does he mean when he say the word or wrote the word justify? Well, he's using it in the sense of to vindicate. Now, the word vindicate can be used to speak of being cleared from guilt or blame, or it can be used to refer to an action that proves a person to be right. It is in this last sense that James uses the word justify. And he gives two examples that we will be looking at in the next sermon. The works of Abraham and Rahab vindicated their claims to faith in God. In other words, proved their faith to be the real saving faith, which is a gift from God. If I say a thing like, I love my wife, how will you know that? How will you be convinced that I love her? And don't say when I buy her chocolates. <laughs> when you see me sacrificing for her, when you see me doing love deeds for her, otherwise my claim for loving her is hollow. There's no substance. It is in that sense that James is using the word considered righteous here. A person is considered righteous if this righteousness is seen in his way that he deals with other people, that he helps the poor, that he gives to the widows and the orphans, that he keeps a tight rein on his tongue, and so on, and so on. But when Paul speaks of justify mostly, or declared righteous, he uses it mostly in the sense of clearing someone from his guilt and so declaring a person to be in right standing with God. James, on the other hand, has more the idea of, you say you've got faith? Show me. Vindicate that claim. You will be considered righteous if I can see it in your works, in what you do. So as you can see, James's view on works and on faith is simply confirming what the whole New Testament affirms. That every Christian saved through faith in the Son of God has this calling to do good works. Ephesians 2 verse 10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance, in advance for us to do. Jesus Christ himself gave himself for us to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. 
Titus 2 verse 14. Now the problem with many of James's readers was that they only confessed the truth. Maybe they, maybe they said a creed. Maybe they prayed a prayer. Maybe they just went to church because their parents were going to church all the time and they considered themselves right with God because of that. But there were no good works vindicating that claim of faith, proving that or backing up that confession of faith. So to address the wrong view of faith, he first gives us an example of a church member, there in verse 14 to 17, of a church member going to church on a Sunday morning. He saw a man there, maybe a whole family, who is poor, who struggles to make ends meet. They have rags as clothes, they couldn't afford their daily meal at that point in time, and he walks up to them and graciously pronounces a blessing over them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, he said, but he does nothing to alleviate their need, he does nothing to help them. James says, this is dead faith in verse 17. It is a faith that only exists in a verbal creed, in what you say, but it has no real muscle. It has no real mercy works, proving that it is the real saving faith. That is a gift from God. This man spoke Christianese fluently, but he did not imitate the works of Christ. Hence, James says, so that, can, that faith cannot be from Christ. It is a hollow faith, an empty claim that you are making. Now that was what we looked at in our previous sermon. Now he involves an imaginary opponent. To oppose his view so that he can substantiate his, his message or his argument that true faith must flow over in works. So if you like wrestling or boxing, you can imagine two people lining up against each other, it's a bout between two boxers, they are going to throw punches, this is a sparring bout, but with an imaginary opponent. And we call him Mr. Someone, verses 18. But someone will say, so Mr. Someone is lining up and he throws the first punch a right straight. You have faith, I have deeds. That's the opening punch of the bout. And it comes from Mr. Someone, James's sparring opponent. I have faith, sorry, you have faith, I have deeds. So as to say, what is this big issue here, James? There is no necessary connection between the two, James. They, they are just two separate pieces of the Christian religion. One person practices religion through faith and acknowledgement and they know the right stuff and that is enough for them and others through works. They are not necessarily connected, you know. Some are professors and some are missionaries. But by not choosing action here, there's nothing wrong with my faith. At least I believe the right stuff, James. How can you then demand that all Christians should both have faith and works? Isn't just knowing the right stuff enough? Ooh, that was a hard blow. James couldn't stand still. The next punch comes from him. A right swing or a left swing. Well, show me your faith, he says, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. In other words, I can show you my faith by my works. Look at what I do. But you know, you cannot. You've got an invisible faith. You have no proof of your faith because you do not have works to substantiate it, to authenticate it. Now the, the words show that James uses here means to make visible. James is saying something like, I cannot see your faith because you do not have accompanying Christ-like deeds, but you can see my faith because I do works that flow from it. I have a visible faith. The, 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 the Greek word for show can also mean prove or demonstrate. And even in this sense, it, it is helpful to see what James is saying here. He's challenging, challenging his 
imaginary opponent, Mr. Someone, by saying, you cannot prove that you have real faith because there are no actions demonstrating your faith. So can you see that James's response shows his opponent and us and the readers that true faith and mercy works, remember what we, how we have qualified those works, are inseparable. The two are always found together. It's like life and breath. When a person breathes, he is alive. When he does not breathe, he is dead. He cannot choose not to breathe and then claims to be still alive. Now, good works, Christ-like works, is to faith what breathing is to a living body. In order to be a living organism, both has to be in operation at the same time to say for, for us to say that that person is alive in his faith, that he does not have a dead faith. Now that one punch from James was not enough. A hook comes in and it's the knockout punch from James. Verse 19. You believe there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that. And shudder. Well, you, you, your faith consists of an acknowledgement of who God is and certain things that you, you need to know about God. And you think that is enough to save you, right? You, you believe that God is one? You, you know the, the Jewish Shema of Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. All Jews knew that. They were trained to know that as children from a very early age. Our, our, Lord, the God, our, our Lord God is one. And this man is, but what he's saying is, you believe this about God. And you know what? It's fantastic theology and a wonderful doctrine. But don't you know that your faith is not so unique as you think? Did you know that even the demons believe that? You know, and they have got good theology and they've got perfect doctrinal knowledge. Poof! Knockout punch. Two. There goes the opponent. James was saying, in other words, dear imaginary opponent, in other words, Mr. Someone, if your idea about faith is just an intellectual body of knowledge or acknowledgement of God, or having the right knowledge of God, you are no better off than the demons who believe and know the same thing. You know, Satan and his evil hordes are also monotheists, Mono one the theists from the word theos, God. You will not meet a demon that is an atheist. Did you know that? They have perfect Trinitarian faith, crying Jesus, the Son of God. They believe in the authority of Christ and the reality of hell. Have you come here to torment us? They ask him in, in Matthew 8. So they have good very good, perfect knowledge of God. And just before the, James's opponent, Mr. Someone, hits the ground, he heard James say, maybe James shouted, and they shudder. At least they show some reaction to that great truth of God. At least the demons do something about their faith, so to speak. They tremble violently, uncontrollably, when faced with the one true God of the universe. In the Greek, we, lit, we read that they literally break out with goose pimples, or their hair stands on end. You see, non-saving faith is, is, is not necessarily non-emotional. The, someone wrote, the, the demons are not simply dead orthodox, they are tremblingly dead orthodox. They shudder at the certainty of what they are to experience, even though they have perfect knowledge of who God is. But can you see, and this is the point James wants his audience to get, that their knowledge cannot save them. Knowledge alone, knowing who God is alone, 
an intellectual acknowledgement of Him cannot save you. If you equate faith with mere knowledge of God or a Christian confession or repeating a Christian creed or saying the magical sinner's prayer after someone and think that alone by itself, by uttering these words and acknowledging these things about God, that will save you. The demons have the perfect doctrine of who God is and they are still lost. If you think that is faith, your faith is dead. Another shade of understanding for this verse is that as demons shudder in fear of judgment, so also ought people whose verbal profession is not followed up with actions. One commentator by the name of Dr. Mu wrote. You see, in the end, James's point is this. What good is a fantastic profession of faith with any change in life to authenticate it? You, you can take a course or a degree in theology at the best university in the world. You can go for confirmation classes in some churches. You can go for pre-baptismal classes or membership classes in others. You can even do the Alpha course. I don't know if they still do that. But will the knowledge of God that you acquire in these studies save you on judgment day? No. Does getting the certificate or degree after such a course confirm that you are a Christian now? That you are saved now? That you are a true believer in Christ now? No. These are all good and necessary things. Don't get me wrong here. But in themselves, at best, they can only confirm what you intellectually believe or intellectually know. In themselves, they are useless when it comes to saving you. They constitute a dead faith. When you stand before God's judgment throne and have to give an account of your faith, what will you say? What will you produce to vindicate that claim? To authenticate your claim. Lord, I have a PhD in theology. Lord, I did the 12-step program or the Alpha course. Lord, I said this, I belong to that church. If your faith is only in your head and it stays there, you have no proof before God for it and even before other people for it. It is an invisible faith. In fact, no true saving faith at all that James already pointed out to us. How can you prove that you've got real faith that is a gift from God, that is a trust in God, the Lord Jesus Christ who saved you on the cross and make, makes you His through faith in Him? How can you prove you have that real faith? It will show in your daily life. It will show in your works, in your deeds. The ones James have mentioned so far, just to name a few. You will imitate Christ in your life in everything you do and say and think and desire. At home, with your wife, with your children, to your parents, at work, in social settings, when you stand in the bank for an hour to, to get some money, or everywhere, all consuming, you will imitate Christ in your life. Those Christ-imitating works will vindicate your claim to true faith. Otherwise, the question is, does that man even have faith at all? Now, we had a few punches thrown. Mr. Someone won. James, two punches and the man is on the ground. Now comes up the banner of victory. That big golden belt that you get after you won about and the banner reads faith without works is dead look there in verse 20 you foolish person do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless let's just stop there for now verse 20 that verse literally reads as follows do you want to know O empty person that faith without works is workless. Look at 
note how James addresses his imaginary opponent, Mr. Someone here. In the NIV it reads foolish person, but in the Greek it literally refers to being empty or hollow. James is telling his opponent that he is empty or hollow by maintaining that good doctrinal knowledge is enough proof for salvation. It is like an empty shell. It looks Christian on the outside, but there's no real substance on the inside. That argument, that claim is hollow. It's empty. Th that word empty in, in this context can also refer to deficient understanding. So in a sense, he's, he's saying to his opponent, are you hollow on the inside? Really? Can you not see this? Is your head so empty that you cannot grasp this? And then also his claims were so empty in the sense that there is no substantiation of it through real deeds, Christ-like deeds. It can also be understood from the way it's used in the wisdom literature, that word empty. The NIV re chooses the word fool here for that. Are you a fool? And a fool is a person who is seen as a rebel or a sinner against God, set up against God, thinking that he knows better than God. Are you such a fool? James is asking. A stubborn, hard-hearted, ignorant person? Ah. And then James also incorporated a pun in the use of the word work here. He writes, faith without deeds is useless, right? That's what we find in verse 20. He did it in question form and he will answer that. We will answer that next Sunday then. But here is, here we find two Greek words and you will only get the pun if you hear it, if you, if you hear those two words, those two Greek words. Faith without deeds, the Greek word there is ergon, is useless. The Greek word there is argain. Can you hear? Ergon, argain. Faith without ergon is argain. Faith without deeds is useless. Now, we lose that a bit in the English. But literally, it reads like this. Faith that lacks works does not work. Faith without works, or faith that lacks works, does not work. A faith that lacks, lacks works is entirely ineffective to save, which we find there in verse 14, when James asks, can such a faith save him? is dead, which we find there in verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. We find it here in verse 20 as well. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? It's not an argument. He's basically saying faith without deeds is useless. You know, if, if your faith is not seen in your life, it cannot vindicate your claim for salvation, your claim for the right faith. It is a hollow promise that you are holding onto. Then you are nothing better off than Mr. Someone in this bout that we've just witnessed. Then you are just like Mr. Someone, a fool who says in his heart, there's no God. Now next, James calls a few witnesses from history to confirm his argument. You know, it's good to say, let me take an example from church life that you, that you are familiar with. And he, and he looks at that guy who came to church and did not help the poor family. And he's good. The second, the second way he defends his, his view, or his argument on faith and works is to say, let me get an, an opponent that asks me certain questions and then... In my answers, you will find out what my argument is and why I believe that faith is empty without works. The third thing he does is, and if that's not enough, let me call some witnesses from the past. Let me get in the people from the past to show you that if you have a faith without works, it is a dead faith. And the people he went to are Abraham and Rahab as two examples of what he meant when he said that faith without works is dead and useless. Now I want to, that to be a complete sermon on its own. 
So I'm going to stop here tonight with Mr. Someone and the bout he lost and the banner at the end that James flies, which we find in verse 20, faith without deeds is useless. The story of Abraham and Rahab and how they serve as examples of what James is trying to convey to his readers here, we will have to look at next Sunday. So, may the Lord bless you. May He keep you faithful. May He turn on the passion in your heart to serve Him, not by words alone, but by works as well. Let your, so that your faith is not just a, a verbal acknowledgement of who God is and knowing good and facts about God, but that it goes over into a trust, a deep, deep trust in Christ that will show in how you conduct yourself. You know, in everything in life, how you handle conflict. It's one of the things that James touched on here. How you treat other people. It's one of the things James touched on here when he says, don't show favoritism. How you help other people. It's one of the things James touched on here. How you show mercy. Let us not practice, if you can put the two together even. Let us not be guilty, maybe that's a better word, of an invisible faith. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for your amazing work of salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you give us the gift of faith to trust in him, that you declare us to be righteous eternally. O oh Lord, and that is through a faith in Christ. My prayer tonight is, Lord, that that faith will not be just a faith alone, but a faith that shows the works of the one in whom we believe. A faith of imitating our Lord Jesus Christ in all our desires, in all the things we do, we work with, the way we treat people, our interactions, our relationships with people, our family and friends, help us, Lord, to not be guilty of an invisible faith. I ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.